Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to you. Glad to have you for worship. I got a couple of announcements I want to draw to your attention. Hopefully you've noticed the baby bottles that are out there in the, the entrance is what I'll call that. Um, we're doing our baby bottle uh, campaign to help support their pregnancy support center. You can pick up a bottle with you anytime between now and, and, and Father's Day. Fill it with loose change and then bring it back on Father's Day and uh, help us support the Pregnancy Support Center that's in Salisbury. Um, everybody at church here, you're invited to join the Men of Honor Bible Study Group this Thursday at 7 down in the Youth Wing. They're going to be watching a DVD entitled The Building of the Ark Encounter, and uh, they wanted to make that available to the whole church. So consider yourself invited. Come join them for that this Thursday at 7. Couples Connect. I'm not going to do any singing for you all this morning. I think I made my case for you last week. But... Uh, I appreciate the support, y'all. I appreciate it. But uh, <laughs> that's uh, this Friday. When we need you to sign up, if you're planning on coming, it's from 7 to 9. The sheet's out there. You can also text if you're signing up. Uh, but the Hot Dog Shack, they're catering food for us, just $5 a couple. You can see what kind of the menu is there. Um, prizes will be awarded for the best-dressed couple as well as uh, the best karaoke performance. And uh, child care is available, too. All that you can sign up for uh, either on out there at the desk or through uh, electronically through texting. So encourage you to join us for that. We'd love to get more couples signed up for that. You're going to have a lot of fun, I promise. Uh, the Hiking Affinity Group, they're hiking to Pilot Mountain this Saturday coming up. They're going to leave church at 8 and return about 2. Uh, only thing they ask is you bring a, a bag lunch with you, but they'd love to have you join them on that hike. You can text Stephen if you plan to come. Uh, the Summer Beach Mission Trip for our youth is July 15th through the 18th. It's $200. There's going to be a parent's breakfast next Sunday, the 19th at 930 in the Fellowship Hall. We'll have some tables reserved to go over the trip details and all the necessary paperwork, but, but love to have any of our high schoolers, middle schoolers join us for that trip. Um, the youth, we're not meeting today. It's Mother's Day. We're going to encourage you to spend time with your family, but next Sunday, we're going to meet here at 4 p.m., and we're going to go uh, rappelling. So encourage you to wear uh, closed-toed shoes, tennis shoes. Don't wear flip-flops. Uh, but, but come out, go rappelling with us. Chris Boardman does a great job leading us through that, and then bring a little money for dinner out with you afterwards. But that'll be next uh, Sunday, uh, meeting down at the Youth Wing at 4 o'clock. Should be back around 7.30. Um, that's all the announcements that I have. Oh, VBS, sorry about that. Not quite yet done. Uh, VBS is just around the corner. Uh, we're in need of about 100 volunteers. If you're a high school graduate or up, you can volunteer to help us out. Sign up sheets are, I think, at the information desk and on the table in the back. But make sure you get those filled out and turn in. Love to have you help, help us make uh, Vacation Bible School great for the kids in our community. On to our prayer concerns. Uh, if you would, just several folks to continue to keep in your prayers. Keep uh, Matt Coyer in your prayers. Keep Myra Rand in your prayers. Keep Brad Hunter in your prayers. Um, Keep all those folks in your prayers, if you would. And uh, that, that's all my announcements this morning. Good to have you with us for worship. Let's prepare to worship the Lord together. Good morning, church. First of all, a happy Mother's Day to our mothers out here, as well as, would like to definitely add, there's also many that fill that role uh, and, and are like mothers. And so, uh, you know, we want to give thanks for you as well. So happy Mother's Day. If you would, please stand at this time. Now we have the privilege to enter into worship as we give our praise to our God who teaches us how to love because he is love and he's the author of love. Let us bless his name this morning. Ba, ba. One, two, here we go. <laughs> All right. 
sing out at the end. Let's go to shout to the Lord. It's all good. He should be our song. Let them, that be our song. We're going to sing shout to the Lord. Here we go. Two bars before. Oh, <laughs> 
All right, as you find your way back to your seats, we're going to continue with the worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings as our ushers come forward and our choir ministers to us in song.
Let's go back to that little place where we used to go in the summer days. The lodge by the water is still my favorite place, and I could come every year, and it wouldn't change. Let's go back to that little place where we used to go in the summer days. We do want to take time this morning to honor and recognize our mothers and to, to pray for our mothers. Uh, but before we do, we want to honor a select few of our mothers uh, every year we we do these course sizes there's three down there and, and julie dill is going to help me give those out but we want to honor our our newest mother that's out there and i'm wondering if there's anybody in here who's maybe had a baby in the last two months or something like that <laughs> okay like hello right here she's waving it down congratulations to katie gray Our newest mom, and then from our newest mom, we want to go to our most veteran mother out there, the mother that's got the most years on the job, the most experience. Do we have any moms in the house today that are over 75 years of age? Raise your hand nice and tall. Is that just one? Oh, there's two. Any over 80? Any over 81? 82? 83? 84? 85, 86, 87. Sis is the only one left. Sis, we're going to just stop it there. Sis, our most experienced mother. We celebrate you today, sis. Um, and then lastly, we're going to do the mother who was, who was burning the midnight oil last night. Which mom was up the latest? I know there was prom. We're going to find out. We're going to, if you've already won a boutonniere, you might want to. Yeah, we'll, we'll, let you, we'll let you bypass this one if that's all right with you. But with prom, maybe we'll know who I was at prom last night. Uh, any moms that were out or up past midnight? Show of hands. Any, any that were up past one in the morning? Two in the morning? Hands went down. Is there anybody that was up past two? Yours is still up. Well, we're going to Mandy over there. Mandy's our burning the midnight old mother. Wait, wait, hold on. I've been told there's somebody else. Carrie. Don't, sorry, Mandy. This always happens. It's always like, Carrie, how late were you up? 3.30. Four. She just put four fingers in the air. Do you want to top four? Do I hear 4.30? 4.35. Okay. Carrie, you did, you did well. We're going to go with Mandy. But we do want to take a second and honor all of our moms. We're so thankful for you, and we would like to pray a special prayer of blessing over you. So if you would, would you pray with me? Father God, in, in your divine wisdom, you made man and woman to become mother and father and to raise children and to shape and mold them. And Father, we celebrate the, the mothers that you've put in our lives that show us your amazing love over and over, your grace, your mercy your wisdom. We're thankful for the countless lessons that they've taught us, the countless lessons they continue to teach us, the love they continue to show us. And we pray, God, that you would give your hand a blessing on them today. 
that you would uh, help them for the job ahead because the job doesn't stop nine to five. It goes all the time. And so be with our moms. Place your hand on them. For those moms that have already gone on to be with you, Lord, we celebrate the, the impact that they've made in our lives. And, Father, we're so thankful for these ladies who have shaped us to be the men and women of God that you want us to be. And so we, we pray your hand of blessing on them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mothers, here's your Mother's Day present. Children's Church for uh, <laughs> kindergarten through third grade. You can head down to Children's Church. I think Miles is going to help walk you down. So, Miles, get over there, bud, if you would. But there go the children. So, mothers, happy, happy Mother's Day to you. Um, Ruth Harper's got that, so happy Mother's Day to Ruth Harper. She's got all these kids today. Um, maybe you're familiar with the comedian Jeff Foxworthy. Let me make sure I'm on. Testing, testing. Are we good? Are we good? You got me? There we go. I forgot to cut it on. Um, you've heard of the comedian Jeff Foxworthy. He does the You Might Be a Redneck If, you know, and and uh, in honor of Mother's Day, I kind of did some some Google searching to see you might be a mother if, and they came up with this list. And so I picked some of the best ones off the list, and I got, I got a few of them here for me. But you might be a mother if spit is your number one cleaning agent. <laughs> Many of us have had mom take some chocolate off our face with a good old spit napkin. I've even seen them use, they must have antibacterial properties because I've seen them used to clean blood before, you know. Moms are good with that. Uh, you might be a mother if sleeping in means you got up at 7 a.m. Some of y'all can relate to that. You might be a, a mother if you tell people to wash their hands roughly 314 times a day. You might be a mother if you feel like you got a mini vacation when you use the bathroom alone. That's why you <laughs> stay in there so long, right? You might be a mother if you're so desperate for, uh, for conversation, adult conversation, that you spill your guts to the telemarketer that calls and he hangs up on you. You might be a mother if you're willing to kiss your child's boo-boo. You might be a mother if your first thought in the morning is, I can't wait to get to bed tonight. <laughs> I have a lot of mornings like that sometimes. Uh, you might be a mother if you no longer communicate directly with your husband, but rather passive-aggressively through your children and your baby. Your daddy forgot to take out the trash again today, didn't he? <laughs> oh, yes, he did. You might be a mother if date night consists of Netflix and Thai takeout that you look forward to all week and then you promptly fall asleep at 8 o'clock. And then you might be a mother if you know how much boarding schools cost. So that might, that might be our mother list there. Uh, but moms, they know what it is to sacrifice. You sacrifice for your family. You sacrifice for your husband, for your kids. Most of the time, you put your own needs second to those of others, you serve nonstop from sun up to sundown, and quite often you do it with little to no honor and recognition. And although you are worthy of, of that honor and recognition every day, your servant and sacrificial heart is worth honoring and celebrating today. And so we give thanks for you. And before we start our message this morning, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts today together be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Uh, well, between serving your husbands and, and serving your kids, moms know a lot about serving. And, and that's exactly what I want to talk about this morning. Uh, Jesus defined greatness by serving. Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28, Jesus says, You know what the rulers of the Gentile, the rulers of the Gentile lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I find it interesting that the word leader only appears in the Bible about six times, uh, but instead the, the most more common frequently used word is servant. Scripture doesn't refer to Moses as my leader Moses, but rather my servant Moses. And the term servant, it speaks everywhere of, of low prestige, low respect, and low honor. And most people aren't attracted to such a low value role. But Jesus, to Jesus, servant was synonymous with greatness. And that was a very radical and revolutionary idea. Christ taught that the kingdom of God was a community where each member serves the other in love. Paul wrote in Galatians 5.13, serve one another in love. You know, the only time Jesus tells us that he's setting us an example 
comes in John 13 where he's washing his disciples' feet. He serves them by washing their feet. And in this passage, we see Jesus stooping to serve. And we see some attitudes of the disciples that are also in the room with him that try to get in the way of his service. And I think we can learn a lot from Jesus about serving and we can learn a lot from the disciples about, about things that we do that get in the way of our serving. You know the story. Jesus, during the meal, uh, got up from the table. He took off his outer clothing. Uh, he wrapped a towel around his waist. He poured water into a basin and he began to go around washing his disciples' feet. This was the work that typically servants and slaves would perform, not their, their great and wise teacher, their rabbi, the Messiah, Jesus. And this didn't sit very well with his disciples. Some wanted to actually wash Jesus' feet instead because they felt unworthy to have him come along and wash their own nasty feet. Their pride was, was getting in the way of letting Jesus serve. But Jesus insisted, you've got to let me do this for you. In fact, if you, if you don't let me do this, then you don't have part in what I'm doing. You can't be a part of this. Well, some of the disciples figured, well, if washing our feet shows that we belong to you, then don't just stop at my feet. Go further. You know, wash my, my head and my hands as well. If washing my heads and my hands, if washing my feet means that, uh, that I belong to you, Jesus, then wash my whole body. That was kind of their thinking. And it's funny how we turn everything into a, a competition. And this isn't the first time where the disciples start kind of having a competition with themselves. Uh, you can go back to James and John when they come to Jesus and they ask him to let him sit on the right and left hand of his kingdom when he comes in his glory in Mark chapter, chapter 10. And when the other 10 disciples heard that they had made this request of Jesus, Scripture says they became indignant with him. I, I love that word, indignant. They became without dignity. They lost their dignity. They were so upset. And so Jesus reminds them again here in Mark 10, 43 through 45, which sounds a lot like the first passage we read. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so here again, a foot washing turns into a competition. You know, I've got more Jesus on me than you did. Uh, you guys just got your feet washed. Well, I got my, my hands and my head as well. And uh, to be honest, we, we do that today. We do it with other Christians. We do it with other churches. You know, y'all don't read the right Bible at your church. We, we read the right Bible at our church. Well, you know what? Our, our preachers don't get married. They're so devoted that they don't even get married. And there goes your, your preacher. He's putting around town in his minivan with his wife and all of his kids. But that's not our church. Well, y'all y'all have wine in your communion, and we don't even have wine in our communion. We do Kool-Aid. We're so against wine. We don't even cook with wine. Well, y'all get out early. Y'all try to beat the lunch crowd. Our church, we worship for hours. That's right. I said hours. There was an S on that. We... <laughs> We get into it. We're not trying to beat the crowd. We really love Jesus at our church. Yeah, but you've never been to the foreign mission field. I mean, I love Jesus enough. I've gone to third world countries. I've served and I've suffered for Jesus. Sounds silly, but we do this. And what sounds even more silly is why would we even think that boasting and bragging sounds like something that Jesus himself would do or that his followers should do? That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 31, and he says it several times in the New Testament, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. See, we got no reason to brag because we're, we're sinners. We, we all have a sin problem and we all need Jesus, every single one of us. Paul, who wrote 13 New Testament books, that's half of our New Testament, referred to himself as the worst of all sinners. And if that's how Paul sees himself, perhaps we need to take a long and hard look in the mirror and see ourselves how we are. So Jesus shot down this idea of a sponge bath. He says, you know, you don't, you don't tell me what to wash, guys. Uh, I know what I want to get clean. And that's something else that we try to do. We try to tell Jesus how to do his job. Hey, Jesus, would you open this door for me and for my career? You know, I don't understand why you won't open this door for me. It, it's what I want to do. Would you, would you just, I know you can do everything. You can do all things. So why can't you open this door for me and for my career? And Jesus is saying, hey, trust me. I care about you and your career, but more importantly, I, I care about your heart. Bring your heart to me. Let's, let's work on that first. And how arrogant of a thought for us to try to tell 
the Messiah, God in the flesh, how to do his job. And see, our arrogance can get in the way of serving, serving Jesus. You wouldn't walk into the middle of a brain surgery and start telling a surgeon what to do, would you? you know, hey, doc, I think we need to remove this guy's medulla oblongata. I don't, I don't think you're doing that. Sounds ridiculous. Uh, some of you around here, you're, you're a little more mechanically inclined than I am, but I know I, I'm not walking into a mechanic's garage and start giving orders. Hey, that car won't start? Well, let's put a new muffler on it. You know, that's, that, obviously, I don't know what I'm talking about, and uh, it's a little bit out of my league. And the sad reality is we need to just trust the experts to do what they do, but we do this with Jesus. We all the time tell him what to do, and then we question when he does something totally different. But he's the God of the universe. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's got a plan and a purpose for what he's doing. Scripture even tells us that he can do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine. So quit trying to tell God how to do his job and trust him to do what he has planned. And so Jesus says, hey guys, I'm just cleaning feet today, all right? So sit there and trust me to do the cleaning. I'm going to wash your feet and that's enough. So we need to understand that he's sitting at our feet as well, ready to clean us all. And all we have to do is to be willing to sit there and allow him to do it. We all need to be clean. Just like those disciples had been out on the dusty and dirty road of life and needed to have their feet washed before dinner, we've been getting ourselves dirtied up by the world that we live in, and we need to sit before Jesus and allow him to clean us up. We need to humble ourselves and recognize that we need to be clean, and he's willing and ready to serve us and clean us up. And then Jesus, when he finished cleaning their feet, he says some very profound words in John 13, 12 through 17. He says, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example. There he is telling us he set an example. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. See, Jesus reminded them there, I've got titles, I've got status, but I'm not too proud to stoop and to serve. No task is beneath me, no people are beneath me. I've set you an example, serve one another. And again, he takes the subject back to greatness. I think he knows that our, our nature is we want status and we want titles we want to be called great i think it's no surprise that our our uh, culture today is obsessed with the royal family uh, my dad and i were talking just a little over a week ago about how funny it is that during the revolutionary war we fought to get out from under the control of the king of england and yet people today are obsessed with everything that the royal family is doing um, but i think it speaks of how we get caught up in titles and prestige We've got a lot of TV shows out there like, like Wendy Williams, TMZ, and Access Hollywood, and Entertainment Tonight, uh, just to name a few that talk about celebrities and all that they've got going on all the time. And again, uh, those folks have a celebrity status in our culture and are seen as great in the eyes of the world. And Jesus is saying, hey man, titles don't make you great. Serving is what makes you great. And serving each other, that's where you'll find a real blessing. He even says you'll be blessed if you do them. And our loving service ought to overflow and extend beyond these walls and the people in this room to the world around us. Uh, one thing scripture reminds us over and over is that it, blessings are meant to be shared. God doesn't uh, bless us so we can just watch our, our pockets get fuller, uh, watch our cars get nicer and our houses get bigger. God blesses us so we can turn around and share that blessing with someone that may be in need. Just this week alone, we've got several opportunities in this place to do that. When you came in this morning, you saw the baby bottles that were out there. We're in the middle of that baby bottle campaign from now till Father's Day. A great opportunity for you to share some of your financial blessings uh, with, a, with a pregnancy support center in Salisbury that ministers to moms in need, uh, help provide, helping provide diapers and formula and baby clothes and classes and, and, uh, and just wisdom and support. Just another way for you and I to use our financial blessings to bless others. This weekend, I, I took a very small group of youth down to Burlington, and we participated in a, another Feed the Hunger packathon. 
And, and these youth were willing to give of their time and their talents and their energy to go and, and be a blessing, packing food for, for children overseas that are in need. We, we packed about almost 80,000 meals in our two hours that we packed for kids in Bangladesh. And, and in that, I want you to hear that you don't have to uh, have financial blessings to share to be a blessing. You've got the blessing of time and talents. And if you can't give of your resources, you, you've still got a blessing of time and talents that you can share. And those blessings are meant to be shared. But Paul really captured God's heart for serving others uh, in, in a, looking at Jesus Christ in a passage uh, from Philippians 2, uh, verses 3 through 8. And it says in there, Do nothing out of selfish ambition, or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to, uh, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Well, there's a lot that Paul left us to unpack here, and we're going to try to do that a little bit this morning. Uh, but first of all, one of the things that I get out of this is we need to evalu evaluate our motives. We've got to evaluate our motives. Uh, it said right there at the start of the passage, to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Why, why are you doing what you're doing to begin with? Why do you want to do the things that you want to do. You know, we're so used to, to being in the driver's seat of our own lives and calling the shots that it's hard for us to surrender that control over to the Lord. Think about it. Every argument that you've ever been in, you've stood up for yourself and you fought for your own cause, believing convincingly that you were right even at times when you weren't. And all I'm saying in that is it's hard to, think, to, to not think for ourselves first and to try to not have it be a, a my will be done mentality. Uh, but that's how, that's not how it goes. It's, it's thy will be done. And so we need to evaluate your motive. Secondly, we need to, to elevate others. Looking back at the passage, it says, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. You know, we get so, so caught up in our own lives that we forget that people's lives are just as important as ours. That the same God who died for us died for them. That the same basic needs that we have, uh, clothes, food, shelter, love, are the same basic needs that they have. And quite often in our own lives, uh, if we're honest, we bulldoze people over to get what we want. What if we treated each other with love, value, respect, and worth that every human being deserves? It's no surprise that, that people struggle with self-worth. Uh, many people have issues with low self-esteem and wrestle with having a low opinion of themselves. Think about all the good that we could accomplish in our community and in our society if we could just elevate others and help them understand their true value. And we can do that. Every day we have opportunities to build others up and to elevate them. To be honest, we already have a, a high opinion of ourselves. Think about this. Uh, you know, nobody in here knows like you do how big of a screw-up that you are. You know, only God knows, knows you better than you are. But we're screw-ups. That's, that's how we are. Uh, I, can, I can stand up here and say, I'm a screw-up, and, and you're a screw-up. Um, but we wake up every day, and we're our biggest supporters. We, we practice grace with ourselves. We forgive ourselves. We encourage ourselves to not give up, but to keep going and keep encouraging ourselves in spite of all those terrible things that we know that we do on a daily basis. And if we can support and elevate ourselves without wavering, perhaps we can likewise be a voice of encouragement and an elevation in the life of another. And so we need to elevate others. Thirdly, we need to recognize other people's interest. Uh, going back to our text, we read, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Have you ever heard or said the phrase, well, that's not my problem? Or, well, that doesn't affect me. Uh, that mindset right there is, is one who is only looking out for their own interest. Uh, my wife happens to be left-handed. Do we happen to have any left-handed people in here today? Show of hands. Got a couple of you. All right. I read this week that about 10% of the population is left-handed, so congratulations to you guys that are left-handed. Uh, but there are a lot, of a lot of tools that we use 
that, uh, that every day were designed for right-handed people, all right? Uh, I brought some of these in with me today. But this is one of the most obvious ones. This is the old can opener that you close and you crank with your right hand. It's not really designed for a left-handed person. So, so you got one, you got one there. You got any coffee drinkers in the house? All right, if you're drinking coffee, you know, you know who you're supporting. Picture your, if you're left-handed, you don't know what you're drinking. You know, you got nothing to look at. Everybody else is getting to enjoy everything. You got nothing to look at there as a lefty. Um, here we go. This is one of my favorites. This is a measuring cup. To a right-handed person, I'm working in cups. To a left-handed person, the useless metric system. <laughs> who cooks with the metric system? Nobody. Except maybe the Swedish chef. He might be the only one. Um, scissors. This never occurred to me. I just thought you switch hands and they work. Uh, my wife literally demonstrated for me when you put it in the left hand and go to cut paper, it just folds. It does not cut. It's designed for a right-handed person. We're not done, people. It keeps going. <laughs> this is a serrated steak knife. Works great for right-handed people. Left-handed people, you're just gnawing it to death. You're just going to wear your arm out trying to gnaw to death. So these are some of the visuals that I brought in, not to mention the fact that you're driving in your car. Everything's right-hand controls, everything on your radio. Your cup holder in your car is for a right-handed person. The, uh, the notebooks that we use in school, also for right-handed people. If you're left-handed, you're, you're riding on that spine all the time. It's annoying. Um, and then desk, desk in school college, you come up, flop them out, they were all right-handed desks. They don't make left-handed desks. And, uh, and so my wife gets quite angry and frustrated at times being a left-handed person in a right-handed world. But I read this week that left-handed people are more likely to have psychosis and anger issues. <laughs> so that probably explains everything. <laughs> but happy Mother's Day, Sam. But here's what I want you to see. There were some educational folks that got together one time and they were talking and they realized, you know what, when we take these big end of the year tests, end of the year exams, it is not fair for these left-handed people to take these long exams on a right-handed desk. And so they kind of allowed things to change in the class. Hey, if, if, there's, if you can, put an empty desk next to them, let them pull that desk up. Now they've got a left-handed desk where you gotta go get just a regular square desk for them. But that wouldn't have happened unless somebody thought to look out for the interest of all the left-handed people out there. And likewise, we're called to look out for the interest of others, to see life from their perspective. We got to go see the, the musical at Carson this past Thursday, and man, they always do a great job with their musicals, and, and this was no different. They did Freaky Friday. I'd never seen the movie Freaky Friday. I just remember the, the trailer, the previews for it, and I knew that the mom and the daughter kind of somehow switched bodies and and the daughter has to live as the mom, and the mom's living as the daughter in their worlds. And, of course, at the end of the story, they kind of realize how much they love and respect each other after living life in, in their world. But as we got there and we sat down and we were looking at the stage and the set design, which was really cool, they had uh, in lights up above the stage the phrase, I walked in her shoes and saw the world her way. And I know it's hard to fully put ourselves in someone else's shoes, but it helps us to keep from just thinking about how things uh, affect us and how decisions affect us. Because uh, we're good at thinking about ourselves. We're not so good about thinking about others. And we're told to look out for the interest of others. And finally, we're told to have a Christ mindset. And as we read in the passage, it says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I want you to notice the first part of that verse in your relationships with one another. Just uh, uh, Jesus always had other people on his mind. Our relational God who created us for community with him, who restored the, the broken community that our sin created between us and him through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for us. He calls us into relationship with each other through his church, his community, his presence in the world, his body, one body with many parts. He calls us to reach out to a lost and broken world and share the message of hope that we have in Christ. So he calls us to have a relationship with the lost. So God cares about our relationships. And in those relationships, he wants us to have a Christ mindset. Well, just what is a Christ mindset? Well, let's look at the rest 
of that passage. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Well, I hear three words in that passage that really describe Christ's mindset. And the first word uh, is humility, then service and sacrifice. Humility. Uh, he stepped out of the wonder and majesty of heaven in all of his glory to come to earth, to be born in a manger, to dwell among his people. He became like us in every way. He humbled himself to his father and gave himself over to die for our sins. He humbled himself to death uh, to receive the death that we deserve, to receive the penalty for our sins on our behalf. And so part of Christ's mindset is humility, then service. He came to serve. He came to serve the Heavenly Father by doing what the Father told him to do. He served people who were hungry, hurting, sick, demon-possessed, broken, lost, and hopeless. And so another part of Christ's mindset was service. And finally, sacrifice. He was obedient to the point of, of death. Uh, Jesus often sacrificed his time and his energy to serve others in need. Uh, you know, just like us, Jesus, I had 24 hours in a day. And quite often, uh, we read that he was kind of, had his own agenda, his own plan. He was, he was headed somewhere, and somebody came along to interrupt his plan with a need. And, and quite often, he was willing to change his plans for those people. And so for a lot, even like us, uh, if we want to serve in a ministry uh, inside the church or outside of the church with Habitat for Humanity or, or Rowan Helping Ministries or or the Pregnancy Support Center, or Main Street Market, um, it's going to take a sacrifice of time. Like Jesus, we'll have to sacrifice our own time to serve. We'll have to say no to some things, and they may even be things that we want to do for ourselves in order to say yes in service. But Jesus sacrificed more than his time. He paid the ultimate sacrifice, giving his life uh, in love and in obedience. He, he willingly suffered an agonizing death, taking 39 lashes, carrying his cross up that hill and being crucified on that cross with nails piercing his hands and piercing his feet until he took his final breath. And as Hebrews says, that for the joy set before him endured the cross. So he willingly and joyfully gave his life, thinking of his father and thinking of us, so that he could pay our penalty and restore our broken relationship with God, the creator of the universe. And so the last, amen, that's right. And so the last part of Christ's mindset was sacrifice. Humility, service, and sacrifice. And as we close this morning, I want to leave by, by giving you a little homework assignment to think about and to try to do this week to help build up your mind, to help work on your Christ mindset. So just two assignments, simple enough. First, I want you to try to elevate someone this week. Think about all the people you're going to come into contact with from those that you live with in your house to those that you do life with at work or school. But look for opportunities this week to elevate others through praise, affirmation, and encouragement. Maybe you can already picture somebody out there who, who needs encouragement and support. Maybe that face is already there, and that's great. You're already seeing somebody to, to reach out to. But elevate someone this week. And then secondly, serve someone this week. Now, my guess is in your home, there's probably certain jobs and responsibilities that fall to certain individuals. You know, dad's probably got his list of weekly things that he's trying to do. Mom's got her list of weekly things that she's trying to do. And the kids probably have their list of things that they're trying to do. But I want to encourage you this week by, by doing a job for somebody for them. And it just doesn't have to be an at-home project. If you've got someone at work that you want to help out like that, that's great. Take it into your workplace as well. But surprise them and, and do their job. But let me add, do it well, <laughs> all right? If you hate your chores and you just do them as fast as you can to get through them, that's not really doing it to serve them. You're going to be doing it to serve your own agenda. Well, Shane said do this. i got two minutes. I'm going to go clean the kitchen. And it's going to look like, what did you even do, you know? And so if you're going to do it, do it right. Take your time. Do it right. Do it well. Do it completely but serve someone this, this week. So elevate someone and serve someone. Something that we all can do.
And if you're here today and you've never said yes to God, if you've never received uh, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me add that he humbled himself for you. He came to serve you. He sacrificed his life for you. And so don't walk away from a God who has a purpose and a plan for your life. Don't walk away today without responding to a God who loves you so completely and so perfectly. He wants a relationship with you. He's shown that by how committed he was to give everything for us, laying down his own life for us. And it's, it's not as hard as it sounds. We, we talk about it a lot around here, the ABCs of the faith, and it's easy to start your relationship with him because here's what's neat. He's done all the work for you. He served you so perfectly that he has done everything necessary to provide the opportunity for you and I to have a relationship with him. We just have to respond with faith. And so the ABCs of the faith, admit that you're a sinner, that you've turned your back to God, admit that you've lived in the driver's seat of your life and you've served yourself, you've served your own appetites, your own wishes, your own desires over and over, and admit that you need him to take control. So that's A, admit. B, believe. Believe that he is your Lord and Savior. Believe that he is the God in the flesh who lived among us. Believe that he is the way to the Father, that he is the truth and that he is eternal life. Believe that he died on a cross for your sins and believe that he rose from that grave on Easter morning 2,000 years ago. Believe that he wants this relationship with you. And then see, commit your life to follow him. He is the way. So lay down your plans and your agenda and get on board with his plan. Surrender your life and your will to follow his leading and his guidance. He's the way to the Father. And he will show you that way as, as you get to know him through his word. But commit daily to walk in obedience to him and so as we close this morning you've got your homework assignment for the week look for opportunities to elevate and serve someone uh, the altar is open if you want to come forward for prayer uh, i'll be down front if you need any prayers or encouragement but before we move into a time of, of final worship let's pray father god we want to follow in your footsteps for you're the way and the truth and the life apart from you we can do nothing so, Lord, move and stir in our hearts in a mighty way that, that, like you, we might humble ourselves and stoop to serve those in need. That we might model that sacrificial love that you put on full display that Good Friday. So, Lord, move us out of the way that your work may be done in us and through us for your glory. We pray and ask all this in the beautiful and powerful and glorious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.
this week we have the opportunity that we have each and every day and that's to go out and serve somebody else in the name of Christ let them whoever we run into this week see him in us go be the church